All right, so I'm Jamie Burke, CEO and founder of Outlier Ventures. Um, we've been in this space for just over six years. Um, uh, I like to say that we were the first dedicated blockchain investor in Europe. Who knows if it's true? Um, and uh, more recently, we're known for um, our accelerator. And this accelerator, you know, always struggling to think of what to call it. So. It doesn't exclude anybody. Well, am I, am I Web3 or am I not Web3? At the same time, to be specific enough that they know the value that they might get from going there. So for now, it's called an accelerated design for um, Web3. So what I wanted to try to do today was to give you um, a bit of that experience. The reality is these accelerator programs are very intense, three-month programs where we just throw a load of meetings at you, investors, uh, people that work in enterprise, it could be customers, um, previous founders. Um, and it's just this hardcore, brutal experience, but you know, generally people come out of it um, with a much more concise view on what they want to do. Um, and so I can't replicate that, it's just me talking at you, uh, rather than you having lots of, uh, you talking to lots of people. Um, but what I did want to do was to look at some of the basic things. So the first one is the opportunity space. Um, and obviously doing that, being aware of some of the tracks that you've got going here. Um, of course, it's slightly different because they're very impact oriented, but I guess the argument should be impact is, is good business. Um, I also want to kind of stress the importance of being um, purposely pragmatic. Um, so pragmatic with purpose, you can say it either way, but one of the big problems in this space is that, um, and again, when I say this space, let's say blockchain or Web3, um, there's lots of dogmatism. People come into it loaded with biases, um, and some of them aren't even aware of it. Um, and so decentralization, for example, could be, could be it. Um, and so I think what's really important is to uh, benefit from much of the learnings of, of st the startup world um, as we're trying to design for new things in Web3 and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then the third one um, is to be positively impactful. Uh, and I'll take a, a little retrospective um, because I think it's very easy, increasingly easy, to be impactful in a world, um, but not all of that impact is positive, and that's especially true in the context of tech and technology and big tech. Um, and again, I would argue that some of that comes from um, perhaps not being uh, pragmatic and being a bit too dogmatic, or just being an asshole. But let's let's assume that they went in with a, 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 the wrong bias. Um, so, okay, Web3, um, and this is a rabbit hole, so don't ask me questions on this at the end of the talk, because I'm not going to answer them. Um, but, uh, you know, what is Web3? I'm sure we couldn't agree in this room what is Web3, and that's okay, because um, it's emergent, um, you know, we're starting to see some of its qualities, um, but it is still quite difficult to define. Um, it's complex and it's confusing. It's confusing for us, and we call ourselves a Web3 accelerator, and we're constantly bickering on, oh, well, yeah, but it should be defined as this, and no, it should be defined as that. Um, so that's just the definition of, of what Web3 is. Um, but then, of course, we're looking at a number of technologies that underpin Web3 or the promise of Web3. Um, and the big challenge there is how do you time these technologies? So if you're an innovator, you're a startup, you know, what technologies should you be looking at today and which ones should you be ignoring? Because you need to make impact now, not in 10 years' time. Um, and that's obviously a very important thing for an investor, how you time technologies. You can be right, um, uh, but you can lose a lot of money um, being right um, if the market doesn't catch up with you. Um, but I think one of the most important things to be thinking through, and again, I'm sorry, I don't have answers, I've got questions, um, is how is value captured, or in a, maybe in an impact sense, how is value distributed in the context of Web3? Um, what uh, what business models might exist within that, which ones are sustainable as we're transitioning from Web 2 to Web 3. Um, we're seeing a lot of startups that pitch themselves as Web 2.5, and actually that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, and then, of course, how is this financed? Ultimately, once it goes beyond you guys in your hack, um, presumably if you want to take it somewhere, you're going to need some money, and so w where might that come from? What are the trade-offs? So, uh, again, let's pretend we don't have a name for it. It's a question mark. You know, so, what, what do we know? Well, what we do know is 
um, perhaps only intuitively, that um, we are entering a new paradigm and it's going to be different. It's going to be distinctly different technically, um, socially and uh, potentially economically. And we know that because we've seen this introduction of an open source innovation and usually that is a prerequisite um, to move into um, a, a new web cycle. Um, it has been the case um, through every other one around information technologies. Um, and uh, usually what happens when that technology is introduced, and let's call it Bitcoin, um, and the idea of digital scarcity, uh, the idea of a distributed ledger, and of course smart contracts, um, these things promise to collapse the previous paradigm. Um, and let's call that Web2. Um, and uh, the business models that exist within it. And again, we could crudely call that platform monopolies. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely in this process, but it is still slightly nebulous, difficult to define. Um, and if we look at uh, the innovation trigger as, as, as Bitcoin, introducing this new toolkit that we can um, configure uh, and apply in different ways, um, it actually is following very neatly the technology diffusion S curve, like scarily so. Um, you know, so almost 10 years on, we're moving out of this period of speculative frenzy um, where a market tries to price the underlying innovation and it can't, it overprices it. And again, that's totally normal. Um, so if that's true, um, then we're now moving into this period of synergy and eventually consolidation. And so for me, when you're thinking about these technologies, you're thinking about this paradigm in terms of business models, um, the focus now is really around synergy, finding synergies between technologies um, and finding synergies between technologies and industries. Um, and so for us, um, that's in the context of a stack, thinking about how stacks of technologies can solve for um, different problems and be applied to different industries. Um, and of course, these are kind of composable stacks. That's one of the, the great innovations of a lot of the open source um, that's been invested in over um, the last 10 years. Um, it's also important to not look at an individual technology in isolation. So um, for us, we've been banging on about something called convergence um, for about four years. Um, and so it's great to see something like Odyssey doing uh, blockchain and AI. And of course, I'm sure if you go to a lot of events, probably for the last couple of years, almost every other panel now is on blockchain and I am uh, making that connection. Um, and, and that makes sense, right? It made sense to us when we wrote the Convergence paper um, because of all the startups that we were seeing, the most interesting ones, at least for us, were those that weren't necessarily identifying themselves as a blockchain startup or from the blockchain world. Often they'd say they were an IoT firm or they were an AI company. And they felt that these technologies helped solve for problems in their technology domain, be it security or, 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 or other things, um, unlocking data silos. Um, and of course, this is true in almost every technology, especially open source technologies. They're usually um, combinations of technologies that have been around decades earlier um, that have just been put into a certain combination. Um, and so it's our belief and has our, been our belief for a while that it is the convergence of um, DLT um, with AI and IoT um, that is, that is going to drive this web paradigm uh, of Web3. And it's going to make possible um, all of these uh, kind of edge use cases. So everybody's been talking about you know, spatial web and additive, additive manufacturing for a very long time. But the reality is these things aren't scaling because they haven't had the infrastructure and the economic paradigm to make that happen. And so we believe um, convergence will, uh, will, will make this possible. So um, the opportunity space. So, uh, we're called outlier ventures for a reason, right? We are looking for the outliers. We speak to uh, over 100 startups a month. That's been pretty consistent since our existence, um, uh, uh, at least for the last four years. And so, you know, how do we try to figure out what is most interesting, most interesting now, and has the most potential? Um, and if that's true for us, then it should really be true for you guys, because you've got one shot. I've got 100. Right, so maybe you get to do four or five of these if you turn them into a proper startup. That's going to take at least five years of your life. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two. Maybe you'll go bankrupt in the process. Startups are brutal. 
Um, so you want to be as sure as you can be that uh, the opportunity is right and it's, it's, it's right now. So maybe to kind of just step back and um, uh, take a, a, a perspective on where I believe the opportunity generally is when we, we talk about things like convergence. So through the proliferation of, share, uh, of sensing and IoT devices and the digitization of many industries and their processes, everything around us is turned into data. And gradually, that's being turned into um, what I like to refer to as information goods. Now, that's not a term that I've made up. It's been around for some time. Um, it's really uh, in the context of the knowledge economy. Um, but I think this is kind of being amplified now. Everything is being turned into data, and everything has the potential to be turned um, into an information good. Um, and that is including the very fabric of life. Um, of course, um, when we're looking at DNA, um, and with innovations, open source innovations like CRISPR, we're talking about the possibility of hacking uh, the very fabric of life. Um, and I believe that that's going to be true in almost every other um, domain. Now, a lot of this has been driven by Moore's Law and these kind of gains that we've been getting um, that's really given the information age a free ride. Right? We haven't really had to optimize for much because we know um, that we're going to be making these gains um, in the, at the hardware layer. Um, now, of course, that's beginning to slow down now. How quickly and when it would end is to be seen. Um, some people are saying that quantum or biological computing will will kind of pick up pick up the baton and, and move that forward. Um, but the reality is that's to forget that uh, Moore's law is not uh, a law of physics. It's an economic law, um, or it's a business management law. The idea is if we put so much investment or continue to put so much investment in a technology, we'll continue to get this rate of uh, return of gains. Um, and the reality is we, we can't do that equation with quantum or biological computing at the moment. We don't know how much money it's going to take to get an equivalent uh, return of gains. So... Um, I propose a slightly different alternative, and this really underpins um, the convergence thesis. Um, and that is that uh, if we think about one of the consequences of Moore's law, it's allowed us great inefficiencies in the rest of the stack. So in software, that's bloat, um, and it's almost fortuitous that this man just walked in. Uh, the other area is data, right? Big data, and the data economy is incredibly inefficient. Um, so hopefully I build on your presentation and not repeat it. I did come and watch it earlier to make sure that wouldn't happen. Um, so uh, what I propose is that um, if we look at convergence, this can enable a new data economy, and that can allow for the commodification of data. And this is what could potentially give, a, give us a, an equivalent uh, in the returns. So for us, that manifests uh, in a stack, a particular stack, um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, as we're moving into this period of synergy, um, and the wonderful thing about a lot of these underlying technologies is they, can, they are composable. They can be put into any number of different configurations. Um, now, for us, we would argue this is the meta stack um, because we believe the most important thing um, in the data economy, if data is the most valuable commodity, um, our information goods and the ability to act upon those information goods. Um, and ultimately, that's to feed into uh, machine learning. So when we look at this stack, and this is where we've been investing uh, over the last several years, we've been investing in technologies that we believe solve for um, a particular specialism um, and in combination uh, can realize this new data economy. And so that's really the production, distribution, and consumption of data. Um, and uh, as I said, there could be different configurations of this. That's the, that's the beauty of uh, this paradigm. So what I mean when I say new data economy, and hopefully I get this right, um, is that we can find a way to incentivize a greater volume of data, but not just a greater volume of data. Because, of course, on the one hand, data is siloed, um, and a lot of it wants to be free, um, uh, free to be used, um, not necessarily free in price. Um, we want to be able to improve the quality and relevancy of data, um, the availability of data, the timeliness of data, and uh, all of these things, um, if we can improve proximity and uh, Ocean, in combination with other technologies like high networks, 
uh, another investment of ours, um, can allow for uh, this proximity of data to where the computation happens, at the edge. Um, and the combination of these things, I believe, promise huge leaps um, in both automation and increasingly autonomous systems. So if we're thinking about that, if that's kind of the design space and we're thinking about where you guys might be applying your, your skills and your knowledge and your time, um, my starting point would be uh, thinking about supply chains in a context of data, thinking about them in a context of the flow of value um, uh, in, in, in information. Um, and what's interesting is, is that um, once you start to measure everything, um, uh, in these supply chains, we will begin to understand, measure, and quantify um, value that is currently intangible at the moment. And so, for example, you could argue the carbon impact of many industries has been so intangible, it's not been measured, it's not been understood as a consequence. And so from an impact perspective, um, the more we can measure, the more we can sense and plug into these systems, um, the more we can understand the complexity of the world around us, um, and we can optimize for things beyond kind of a very uh, um, rudimentary form of economic growth. Um, so mapping information flow is value flow. Um, thinking about ways that you can maximize the creation utilization of data and information goods, subsequently information goods. Um, removing bottlenecks in, in how you can optimize that flow. And then thinking about capturing or distributing that value. And again, I'll leave that up to you as to you know, the business model that you want to perpetuate. Do you want to think about how you can replace, uh, disintermediate, capture, uh, or distribute? And hopefully you, you, you can do a bit of both from an investment perspective. That is, would be a requirement on my, on my part. Um, we're not purely an impact investor. So this is, um, who's seen this before? OK, about half the room. It's been a very controversial subject, probably still is, about how you understand value in Web3. So we've just been talking about value flow and information. Um, but how does that really work in the context of Web3? How does that work when you're thinking about business models? So it's been fashionable, and I would argue I'm, I'm kind of still partially in that camp to think um, that uh, there's something called the FAT protocol thesis. So you know, crudely, what was different about Web2 to Web3 is that a lot of the value had accrued at the application layer um, and not much at the protocol layer. And the idea is with things like tokenization, um, a lot more value can accrue at the protocol layer as kind of a commons, um, and therefore you would have thin applications. So and there are lots of consequences to this thinking. The thinking primarily is, well, actually to step back a bit, when you think of value, what's been most confusing um, is that people think, you know, value capture is conflated with investment returns. So people think that if you say all the value is going to go in a protocol, that means just put money in protocols, don't do it in applications. Which, of course, is not true. If we're thinking in the context of what I've just been saying, value is uh, currently data. Right? So it is, is not debatable that right now most of the data has accrued at the application layer. When we think of these platform monopolies, these platform monopolies, the data monopolies, are now AI monopolies. Um, and so, you know, does that carry across into this new paradigm? How much data will happen on this public ledger? How much would happen um, would happen privately? So again, these are kind of unknowns. But one of the arguments is, in an impact context, that if we are living in an era of thin applications, then the great thing about that is you don't need to build all this infrastructure. This infrastructure will be built for you. Um, all you have to do is piece it together um, and make it usable in some way, or act as a bridge into the physical world, um, and everything else can kind of happen uh, further down the stack. Um, and so effectively, that can also remove the economies of scale that go with the cloud architecture and the previous paradigm I discussed, which was this kind of um, cloud platform. Um, but at the same time, if you're thinking about how you then monetize that, the argument goes, and again, a lot of this is theoretical, um, that you won't be able to derive as much revenue or profit by being a thin app because um, you don't have this moat, uh, which is a cost. You know, so the fact that your business requires billions to go into it for it to work is usually a barrier to other people um, coming and eating your lunch. Um, that, that won't be true conceptually, theoretically, uh, in, uh, in the thin application. Um, 
So again, the reality is we don't know. This is a re really a moving target. It's almost definitely going to be more complex than that. Um, but these are kind of considerations and things that we work through uh, at our accelerator. Um, so the only real example that we've got right now is DeFi, decentralized finance. And I, I don't know, again, who's familiar with that term? OK, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, and so this is uh, arguably how you would configure a stack thinking about DeFi in the context of thin applications. This is uh, something one of our analysts did. Um, and so currently, this is used as evidence of a truism of the, the FAT protocol um, thin application thesis. Um, but how transferable is this uh, to uh, domains where decentralization isn't a prerequisite? I mean, it's called decentralized finance, firstly. Um, but the reason why it's decentralized is for regulatory arbitrage, primarily. right? So it is a prerequisite um, uh, for that kind of domain. Um, and even here, where USD locked up has jumped 40%, I think, in January alone, it's still below 1 billion. Um, so that's dwarfed by the more centralized players in the domain that would say that they're Web 2.5, like Coinbase or Binance. So even in this domain, um, there are moats, regulatory moats, cost moats, which mean there's heavy centralization. Um, so how true it is, I don't know. It's also likely that what we're seeing as a trend is projects that start out in DeFi very quickly raise money and try to look to acquire a regulated business. Um, so they can use DeFi as a sandbox, but ultimately they need to cross, cross into fintech and get customers. Um, they need to become regulated. So again, what else should you be thinking about? Where's the opportunity? Well, um, one thing that we've really observed is, uh, and m maybe we've contributed to it, we put a lot of money into infrastructure. Um, in fact, I can think of only a handful of what you might regard application oriented businesses that we've invested in. Um, and the sad truth is that if you go onto GitHub, sub 1% sub of all developers are uh, using any of this technology, not just our portfolio, but just like blockchain generally. Um, so there is really poor adoption. Most developers don't understand it. They don't value it. They don't know how to use it. Um, so a big trend that we're seeing now is uh, kind of middleware um, teams coming along and making this stuff usable. Um, where the end user or the customer is a developer, so the developer to developer type solutioning. Um, and maybe this is required before you can start thinking about um, you know, end users, whether that's consumers or, or B2B customers. Um, and uh, it's also true that if you speak to any enterprise at the moment and ask them what blockchain technologies they're using, the answer is usually always Corda. I hate to tell you all. But um, you speak to them about Hyperledger and Ethereum and anything else. Um, and the reason is because of the support that they get from Corda. So even if they don't think it's the greatest solution in the world, they don't want to have to figure out how to use this stuff. And the problem with most of this open source stack at the moment is, as I'm sure you'll all either already experience or about to experience, there isn't much support. You're still figuring a lot of this stuff out. Um, because many of the businesses behind this are not commercial entities. So maybe that's something you can fit into. Um, equally, I know this is uh, the opening talk from today, it's something very close to our heart. We are a big investor in Sovereign. We've incubated them effectively over several years. Um, the idea that ultimately you cannot have a decentralized web if decentralization is the aspiration um, until you solve for identity and self-sovereign identity. Um, and this is increasingly important as how we interface with the web is hoovering up more and more data. So if you think about what's about to hit us with AR and VR, um, soon there's going to be biometric data being hoovered up whilst you're watching God knows what you're watching on those things. Um, and uh, it will know more about you than you know about yourself. And as we shift from an attention economy into an intention economy, this is something we really need to fix. Um, if we're looking for a more equitable uh, data economy. Um, finally, um, on one of the opportunity spaces, if you look at convergence, um, for us, when you think about the population of the internet, most people think of it as people manually doing things on the internet. Um, although already more devices connected to the internet than people, half of all web traffic is from bots, and half of that is what you class as malicious. So when you're designing for the internet and the web, how much are you actually designing for people? And one of my big arguments has been, um, when we're thinking about tokens and tokenization, I believe they're most powerful 
Um, when acting as incentive mechanisms for things that can be logical, and often people aren't very logical. Um, so if you're thinking about the power of tokenization, I think thinking in the context of the machine-to-machine -machine economy um, is a really interesting domain. Um, and But coming back to the, 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 the identity piece, you have to solve identity first, because if we are going to devolve greater agency and with something called autonomous economic agents, um, Fetch.ai is a project we invested in that uh, does just that. Um, the idea is we can devolve greater economic work to agents to carry out on our behalf on the internet. Well, we can't do that when we know those agents will serve a platform and not our own personal interests. So all of these things are, are intertwined. So again, thinking in an impact perspective, if we think about the gross inefficiencies that exist in our world, and we think all of a sudden we have um, convergence and this new data economy where we can sense with greater efficiency, we can turn that sensing into data, we can make that data, data available to turn into information goods, those information goods can train increasingly autonomous systems, um, then in theory we can solve many of these problems. We can optimize, the optimization function um, can be to solve for um, inefficiencies in any of these areas, both purely digital um, and also physical. So being impactful, and as, as I said, being impactful positively. How much longer do I have left? Four minutes. Okay. I'll do this one quickly. So being impactful in a positive sense. As I said, it's very easy to be impactful in this world, um, but not necessarily easy to do it in a positive way. So who here's read this? Okay. Um, and that's usually always a really low number, and it always really surprises me. Um, and it was actually something I only read a few years back, so I can't take like a moral high ground there. Um, but this was a defining piece of um, cyber culture, and uh, I think it was 1999. Um, and uh, it had some express statements. Um, and I'll just read a few few out to you and, and see if you can draw some conclusions with the web that we've now inherited. Um, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply here. That was a design choice. That was a clear design choice. These were seen as contracts of the state. They weren't welcome in cyberspace. It was the final frontier. We were going to do away with the shackles of, of, of state. Um, and there would be some kind of magical social contract where we would just figure this stuff out. Um, now, actually, uh, that morphed into a new economy and a few other things I'll talk about a little bit later. But it clearly has a libertarian bias. Now, you might say that's fine. Um, uh, but ultimately, so many people take many of the principles in here, including things around decentralization, by the way, as kind of just fact. It's exactly, nobody really debates that these things should be going into how we design the web or the internet. Um, and so we can continue to make the same mistakes. Um, who can guess who said this? Since I've got four minutes, Tim Berners-Lee. So uh, in his book, Weaving the Web, really difficult to get hold of, by the way. You have to go on like, eBay to buy it. Um, um, but again, like very clearly, uh, there is a statement here which has an implicit belief that market, market fundamentalism, will fill the gap, right? So moving on from the declaration of cyberspace, where there would be the social contract, now the social contract is replaced by markets. Markets will efficiently solve this, and actually we want to remove as many rules as possible. Um, and it would kind of be this self-governing self space. Um, and so the consequence is we get that. And I don't believe that was the intention of uh, uh, either of the two authors. Um, uh, of those things. And you know, many of the people that invested a lot of time and money um, and effort uh, in realizing the protocols that underpin this. Um, we now have uh, you know, what you call fang. Um, and interestingly, in China, it's called bats fangs, which is probably a little bit off topic right now. But um, uh, the idea is it's vampirical. Right? These guys are sucking your blood um, uh, through what is now called surveillance capitalism. Again, if you haven't read that book, read it. It lays out um, this economic paradigm that we live in, and that's why I say Web3 
I hope is going to be different. It's going to be different technologically, socially, and economically. Um, but actually, whilst in the West we have surveillance capitalism, in the East you could argue we have digital statism. So subordinated to, rather than a market and a corporation, you have it subordinated to the state and the greater good, um, define greater good. Um, and interestingly, in Europe, we also have a slight variation, I believe, I would say this, um, perhaps a better one, which is uh, a market, but in check. You know, the role of regulators, I think, we, we, we place with greater importance here. But again, these are all biases that we are putting into the things that we're designing. And it's at least important to understand um, the history of what may be influencing your design decisions, even if you end up at the right ones. Um, equally, there is this kind of mantra in startup land of move fast and break things. Okay, maybe in blitz scaling, you know, most of the large um, uh, companies that we listed on the previous page have taken this approach to the detriment of everything else. And ironically, you could call them anti-social media companies rather than social media companies. Um, uh, now, that might be true if you're just creating a hardcore you know, commercial startup, but if you're designing a new economic system with tokens, you really don't want to be moving fast and breaking stuff, right? Um, or anything that's going to have, um, you, you, you know is going to have a, a social impact. And so actually that forces us to take a different approach. I don't know exactly what that approach is because you, you, you can still run out of money really quickly by being too thoughtful. Um, but we, we've got to figure out some kind of balance there. And equally, um, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, one of the things that continues to shock me because of this dogma is how quickly people want to commit to code. They want to launch a protocol, they want it to be totally decentralized, and they assume that all their design choices and assumptions are going to be okay. And then they have to fix them. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a problem. So um, one thing that I've uh, been proposing for a long time, and I know that's not perfect, there's no perfect way of doing it, it's a squiggly line, don't read too much into it. But the idea is it's a pathway. And so I believe there should be a pathway to decentralization. And that's important for a number of reasons. There's a regulatory component. So now you can't just get away with issuing tokens, um, especially in the US. Um, but more generally, you, know, you have to show that you have a product, you have a market fit. You can't put you know, the speculative risk and, and component on uh, an end consumer in many markets. Um, but the idea is even putting that aside, putting a putting aside the regulatory con constraints of what you should be doing in blockchain. Um, there's also just the fact that you don't want to commit things to code um, and hard code them into the system until you've, you've validated them as much as you can. And even then, you want to allow for a, a way to correct them. Um, and so this idea of governance by you know, pure algorithm, uh, I, I don't know. And we've, again, we've got a guy in the audience here who, who'll be able to tell you more about that than me. Um, so finally, how are we um, financing? this. Um, and again, you know, there, there are different ways, different money comes um, with a different price. Um, but the reality is, if you're doing anything that might be regarded as a blockchain startup, and especially if it's got a token, like we're in the trough of disillusionment right now, you're going to find it really difficult to raise money. So I know blockchain startups not saying they're a blockchain startup. They're trying to find any other way to describe themselves than they've got blockchain in it. And some We've had a few go through the accelerator program, and they're just like, but the whole point of it is they don't need to know like the technology we use to deploy it. They just want to see the benefits. Um, uh, now, actually, that's not totally true. If you go to Asia, um, there is still interest in 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 these networks and tokenization. Um, uh, however, I think that's very much going to be influenced by some of the larger networks that are coming online um, and how much money they lose everybody um, because they're coming out at some ridiculous valuations. Um, so I think you're going to have to look for money beyond the usual sources. I, raising money through an ICO is, is, is not going to be what it was. Um, even raising money through a SAFT, which was an instrument which was like a promise for a future token with no real obligation, that's kind of over now. Um, previously known as convertible. And so you're going to have to build a real business. Um, it, it, as much as it pains me to tell everybody, we've all got to figure out how to actually make money. Um, because increasingly, we're going back to even more conservative VCs who actually don't care about this space, and worse than that, are put off by it. Um, so, um, so looking at different kinds of money that come in, okay, some protocols 
are trialing new innovations like mining rewards for people that build apps. Um, there are still bounties. Um, I was a big proponent of what would be um, the Hungry Protocol. I believe protocols, well endowed protocols with loads of money would be sprinkling money on startups um, to build an ecosystem. That's not really happening. Um, but what is happening, and I think the really smart thing about this event is, is impact focus. Because there are increasing amounts of money um, oriented around impact and impact investing. Um, BlackRock, um, which is you know, one of the largest uh, fund managers, I think it's like over a trillion. Did I put the number there? Ah, there you go, seven trillion under management uh, have now signed up to Climate Action 100 plus, um, which basically means they will, they'll take money out of things that don't show that they're responsible. Um, now that's going to trickle down, that money that comes from uh, organizations like BlackRock is going to trickle down into becoming LPs, limited partners into funds. Funds will start to be more impact oriented. Um, so aside from it just being good for the world, um, it, it should be good business. It should actually make it easier for you to raise money. So well done for having that as... Uh, right. Let's hope so. Um, uh, equally, I think you know, linking your impact to ESGs um, is just smart. And we know that um, despite all of that kind of negative press I was giving to blockchain, um, the EU has launched a 2 billion plus AI blockchain fund. So again, um, right on time. And that's got to trickle its way through VCs first. And as I said, a lot of those VCs are um, being very uh, cautious in the space. So I've got to wrap it up now. Um, so, but finally, the, the, the thing that I say to all startups that go through the accelerator is there are lots of things that you could do. And there are a lot of, a lot of reasons why you might do that, to make loads of money, to impact the world. But imagine you make no money. In fact, worse, imagine you go bankrupt in the process of trying to do this. And your wife leaves you, your husband leaves you, and your world implodes um, doing this project over 10 years of your life. Would have you still done it anyway? And so I think that's what you've got to decide when you're picking this solution right now. So that's it. Thank you very much. I don't know if we've got time for questions. Yes, we yeah. do. Thank you so much, Jamie. <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Please just raise your hand and uh, go ahead. Um, well, personally, I, I believe in the power of tokenization to coordinate these kind of distributed systems. Um, I believe in the idea of digital scarcity um, as, you know, and especially programmatic digital scarcity um, as a way to um, as a way to encode value uh, and to make that transferable and turn it into information goods, especially in the context of data. Um, but you know exactly where you would draw the the lines between should that function purely at the protocol layer, what role might it have at the application layer? I know the big thing at the moment is thinking about tokenization almost as a loyalty kind of system. Um, uh, I think the jury's still out. What, what I would say is that um, it's more of a question of when are you thinking about this, right? Because I think that. You could, you could get an initiative going without a token. In fact, that might be preferable. Because um, it's just another friction point. Right? It's another friction point to use. It's another friction point to an investor. Um, um, but you know, in your mind, you understand the Web3 paradigm. You understand this tooling that's available. Um, and then you think about the appropriate point at which you might want to kind of coordinate the system. I believe in the power of tokenization for open source. Um, but yeah, I, there is no click answer, to be honest with you. I mean, it's such an evolving domain, but there's guys here that are pretty much dedicated to kind of figuring that out. Thanks. I a question here up front? Um, yeah, actually, I was going to suggest um, elaborating on your point about machine to machine versus human to machine. Yeah. I'll try and do it justice. If I fail, you, you can do it. You can get up and do it for me. Um, yeah, so again, you know, people are messy, illogical. You know, ask any economist. They never do what they're expecting them to do. Um, 
But machines, in principle, in, in theory, are logical, um, and you know they'll respond well to incentives or disincentives. So if we're thinking about complex systems, and you know this isn't anything new, right? We've seen this in gaming environments um, for a long time. So the project we invested in Fetch, they were from DeepMind, some of the early DeepMind team, and many of the people in DeepMind had a gaming background, right? So they'd already tested out agent-based systems and how you can get them to behave by using incentives and disincentives. And I was just talking to somebody earlier. What's interesting is um, if you think about autonomous systems at the moment, like cars and stuff like that, um, actually, for that to reach full effect, they've got to figure out how to deal with humans first. Right? The problem isn't getting them to work with one another. It's to, to deal with human beings. And so I, I quite like the idea of hybrid systems and, and, and how that might work. But my personal belief is that tokens are digital commodities that are going to make these kind of protocols or systems work. Um, and ultimately, people won't have to understand them. They shouldn't have to un understand them. They should be abstracted away. Um, and so, you know, somebody always, the big question is, well, why do we need thousands of tokens? People are never going to have a wallet with a thousand tokens. In. And I totally agree. Um, maybe they shouldn't even have one token in it, right? They just should be interacting with the world around them. And the world is coordinated and incentivized to behave to a social contract um, uh, through, through incentives and disincentives. And so I think the greatest potential is um, how these can organize autonomous systems. Um, and yeah, hopefully that will be totally invisible. We just, we just get the, the net benefit. Um, so yeah, for me, that is the biggest opportunity. The biggest opportunity nobody needs to understand, almost. Apart from you guys, because you're going to invent some of it. There's a question up front up there. And then last question up there. Thank you. I'm curious about how, uh, what is the future of how we formalize the business vessels carrying all this uh, development. So we have the model of limited uh, liability companies, right? And usually they, they start, they develop some stuff. Sometimes they turn into foundations, which is great because that's for public good, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, especially in your accelerator, how do you, how do you perceive this uh, future of uh, the legal side of things? How do you sort of, uh, yeah, um, how, how do you build a legal entity around the actual ver venture? So yeah, so there's, there's two answers to that question. Again, being pragmatic um, in the accelerator right now, create a company, you know, because very few investors want to invest in anything other than, you know, a, a limited company. And even then they might have a specific place they want it domiciled for how IP is treated and, you know, tax and all this kind of stuff. Um, at an intellectual level, I've always been fascinated by the possibility of the cooperative model. So I uh, was a founding member of the platform co-op movement in New York, um, uh, because I believe if you're thinking about shared infrastructure, the closest thing that we've had that's worked at scale has been the cooperative. Um, now, the problem with cooperatives are they're just like really old and clunky and not sexy and just too bureaucratic. And so some people think a, a DAO could replace that. Um, and I think over time, that might make sense. But again, right now, it's just another friction point. Um, so, but I, I do think as we're moving into this new data economy, um, we're increasingly be looking at things like, I think uh, Trent calls it an AI commons, I call it an AI cooperative, I can't remember there's a, but shared ownership of data, shared ownership of AI, the resulting um, intelligence that might come about, that could be at a city level, uh, it could be within a consortia, it could be within a group of friends. I think that kind of makes sense. If we're not going to have platform monopolies own it all, does it make sense for me as an individual to own it? Probably not. Do I want to pull it and aggregate it? That, that kind of makes sense. So um, I'm hoping either the cooperative movement like upgrades really quickly, or or maybe the DAO movement gets a little bit more less dogmatic and a little bit more pragmatic about how th they can attract money into what they do. Decentralized legal entities. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, I mean, that as an innovation, it's interesting. Would I tell a startup right now that needs to raise £500,000, otherwise they run out of money? I'd say read, read books on that and focus on closing the money. Open up a bank account. Yeah. All right, last question. Hi. Uh, you had a slide where you've shown the path to decentralization mm. in the current climate, going from VC investment to uh, a well-distributed token. Can you give examples of that? Because, I've, I mean, the 
the things that we've seen so far with VC coins were not really convincing. I'm not saying the ICO model was a lot better, so we had a lot in lots of situations the token and then did not end up with the people that really needed it. But yeah. Um, I'm curious for successful examples. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't think I put VC. I mean, we can go back to it. I think I said equity, right? So equity or convertible. So I didn't state the type of money, but the, the mechanism that you would take that money in. So I don't think the implication, let's see if we can go to it. Yeah, I don't think I say VC there, but maybe it's implied because I'm a VC. But, um, you know, the idea is that the reality is, actually, so irrespective of what I think, um, where previously um, people would aggregate um, capital um, and effectively crowdsource this through an ICO, um, uh, I mean, th that's really over now. From a regulatory perspective, we've been working with a project in the US. It's taken them um, two and a half years, millions, to engage with the SEC to be able to say, look, we've done everything possible to show that this is a utility token. You know, we've not sold it to people that can't, all the boxes ticked and the SEC's like, ah, you know, I, I don't know. We, we can't give you any guarantees. Now, if you want to work with a large enterprise before you launch the network, they're going to want assurances that there aren't liabilities and them running a node. And it's like in the US, it's, 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 all, it's prohibited effectively and, until I see evidence otherwise. Um, in other environments like Europe, maybe it's a, it's a bit more free. But honestly, if we go back to this idea about, I would argue you don't want to be a public company on day one anyway. There's a reason why a lot of companies stay private for a very long time, because the public are a pain in the ass. I mean, honestly, you're trying to iterate, you're trying to find fit with your startup, and you've got to justify every decision to 5,000 people that have never run a startup, probably never had a job, like a proper job. Um, it, you, don't need, you don't need that at that stage. Well, I would argue whilst you're lean and you're trying to find market fit, you take money, friends and family, could be angel investors, could be people from the community. You do that in an equity-based company. Um, and then you build out the tech, you remove some of the risk, and then as you get closer to finding fit, um, you, you launch the network and the token should have utility in that network. It should, it should be able to function out the gate. Now, I'm risk averse. I appreciate that that means not everybody gets to play. I don't decide that. The, the US decides that, right? So if people have a problem with that, take on the authorities in the US. Right? Uh, my role is to play by the How rules. How about bonding curves as a, as a strategy? Starting I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off. We're really running out of time. Sure. We can talk about it after, yeah. Thank you so much, Jamie, for sharing everything. Thanks.